Hello there, thanks for joining me this Wednesday. I'm Muhammad Amahamdan and these are tonight's top stories. Cabinet gives not to lower voting age to 18. Another senior leader quits Amno. And Najib expected to be charged again tomorrow. We begin tonight's bulletin with this story. Another senior UMNO leader has quit the party. This time, it's former Foreign Minister Dato Sri Anifah Aman who resigned as the party's Supreme Council member. Kimani's UMNO division leader and as party member with immediate effect. His resignation letter was submitted to UMNO Secretary General Tan Sri Anwar Musa today. It was said that Dato Sri Anifa's resignation was to enable him to fulfill his promises to the people of Sabah in fighting for the demands pertaining to, Malay to the Malaysia Agreement 1963, MA63. During the 14th general election campaign, he promised that he would quit if AMNO and Barisan National failed to restore the rights of Sabahans. Yesterday, former International Trade and Industry Minister Dato Sri Mustafa Mohammed announced his departure from AMNO after being in the party for 40 years. His decision shocked many as he was elected to the AMNO Supreme Council with the most number of votes during the party polls in June. Meanwhile, eight AMNO leaders have denied claims that they are leaving the party, as stated in a list which went viral on social media recently. So far, only two of the 17 names in the list have announced their decision to quit. The eight leaders are Datuk Sri Hishamuddin Hussein, Datuk Sri Dr. Shamsul Anwar Nasara, Datuk Sri Shahidan Kasim, Datuk Sri Bung Mokhtar Adin, Datuk Sri Muhammad Nazri Aziz, Datuk Jalaluddin Alias, Datuk Muhammad Salim Muhammad Sharif and Datuk Muhammad Nizar Zakaria. According to Datuk Sri Hishamuddin, he has no reason to quit AMNO, but he felt the leadership needs to show a clear direction to all party members. Datuk Sri Shahidan also said no one has invited him to quit AMNO, and he has not invited anyone in AMNO to leave. As for Datuk Sri Nazri, he said he owed it to AMNO members and his voters who supported him over the last 25 years as MP to see things through. Other leaders also pledged their loyalty to AMNO, saying they will continue the party's struggles in protecting the interests of the Malays. In a related development, AMNO President Dr. Sri Ahmad Zahid Hamidi hits out at the party's two former stalwarts for quitting as support for the country's largest Malay political organization continues to decline. He said Dr. Sri Mustafa and Dr. Sri Anifa's resignations reflected their weakened resolve in times of crisis following the party's devastating defeat in the GE14. In a statement today, Dr. Sri Zahid also said leaving the party at a time it is being tested is not something that is commendable or should be emulated. The former Deputy Minister also criticised the reason stated by Dr. Sri Mustafa that led to his resignation, saying it is wrong to use the party's weakness as an excuse for one's personal agenda. However, he added the party accepted and respected their decisions. He also called for party members to remain calm and assured them that the leadership was looking into addressing such issues and expressed hope that the crisis would not weaken AMNO and that measures were being taken to rejuvenate the party. Moving on, the report on assets and possessions of all members of parliament, including Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad and the members of his cabinet will be made public next month. It will be published on the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission MACC's official website from October 1st. Its Deputy Chief Commissioner Dato Shamsun Baharin Muhammad Jamil said a special task force is compiling a report on the assets and possessions of all MPs. He also said the anti-graft body will take the necessary action if any false information had been submitted. The directive on declaring the assets of cabinet ministers and lawmakers was in line with Pakatan Harapan's commitment in reforming the country while ensuring transparency 
and preventing any abuse of power. On July 9th, the Premier announced that the PM, Deputy PM, Cabinet Ministers and MPs from the ruling party will be regarded as public officers, which makes them accountable to the country's anti-corruption laws. He said the government is also mulling the inclusion of asset declarations by family members of those in the group. Now, former Prime Minister Datuk Sri Najib Tun Razak is expected to be charged again at the Kuala Lumpur Sessions Court at 3 p.m. tomorrow. He was taken into MACC custody at 4.13 p.m. today after he arrived at the Commission's HQ in Putrajaya about an hour earlier. The Antigraph body said in a statement this afternoon the former Premier would be charged under the MACC Act 2009 for alleged abuse of power when he was in office. It is understood that the charge is related to the 2.6 billion ringgit deposited into his personal bank account that had been widely linked to one Malaysia Development Berhad 1MDB funds. In July, Dr. Sri Najib was charged with four counts, three for criminal breach of trust and one for abuse of power in relation to some 42 million ringgit transferred into his bank account. Last month, he was charged with three more counts of money laundering related to the same transaction. The Kuala Lumpur High Court fixed February 12th to 28th and March 4th to 29th next year for trial. Still in Putrajaya, Rela has lodged a report at the MACC headquarters against its own personnel, Melvin Cheong Moon Kai, for withdrawing his report against businessman Liao Sun Hee, who assaulted him and two other Rela members on duty. Rela Director Mohamed Razib Buhaini, who launched the report, wanted investigation to be conducted to ensure there was no corruption or breach of integrity involved in the action by its personnel. He also claimed that Cheong, who has since been suspended from work, did not consult the department before withdrawing the police report. Dapat keraguan yang mana kita kita lihat aspek ini perlu di diteliti dan dengan itu kita mohon bantuan daripada pihak SPM untuk uh, menangani ya, kes terbabit uh, dan kita berharap uh, perkara ini dapat diselesaikan dengan segera dan uh, perkara ini merupakan satu perkara yang kita ambil serius bagi melindungi dan menjaga nilai integriti jabatan. Last September 7th, the Ampang Magistrate Court granted a discharge not amounting to an acquittal to the businessman claiming to have a Dato Sri title on two charges of assaulting and obstructing a RELA member from carrying out his duty last year. Magistrate Muhammad Firdaus Sad Sadina Ali made the decision after being informed that one of the three victims had withdrawn his police report against the businessman after accepting Liao's apology. Meanwhile, two officials of a Felkra Berhad subsidiary, including a managing director, were remanded for five days from today for investigation into alleged misappropriation of government funds and awarding of training contracts worth 4 million ringgit in 2014. Putrajaya Magistrate Shah Wira Abdul Halim issued the remand order against the duo to assist MACC's investigations. The 53-year-old MD was arrested at about 6.20 p.m. yesterday at the Commission's headquarters in Putrajaya, while the other suspect, a 45-year-old business development and strategic marketing advisor at the same company, was arrested at the Kelantan MACC office the same day at 5.40 p.m. Their arrest was made after the anti-graft body raided 10 locations, including a Felkar subsidiary office in Setapa, Kuala Lumpur, the agency subsidiary office in Kelantan, and the offices of companies which receive the contracts in the East Coast, Klang Valley and Pera. In Johor, a road transport department JPJ personnel was remanded for seven days to facilitate a probe into the issuance of driving license that did not follow proper procedures, which is also known as lesen terbang. The remand order was issued by Johor Bahru Court Registrar Muhammad Salihuddin Abdul Sani this morning. The suspect, who is believed to have accepted bribes for issuing the driving license, was nabbed at the Pulau Pinang MACC office yesterday. The Transport Ministry recently said that there were some 14,000 illegal driving licenses issued in the past two years. This came after authorities busted a syndicate producing illegal driving licenses. In other news, the voting age will be lowered from 21 to 18. This decision was made at the Cabinet's weekly meeting today. 
Youth and Sports Minister Syed Sadiq Syed Abdurrahman, who revealed this, also said that work on amending the federal constitution will begin soon. According to the minister, the government needs to work closely with the youth wings of opposition parties on the matter, as a two-third majority is needed for the related laws to be amended. Said Sadiq also said the new voting age can be introduced by the next general election. He also expressed confidence on the cooperation of the opposition parties, as based on his informal discussion with other youth leaders, they too are keen on the matter. Under the law, 18 is the legal age of adulthood, which among others enables you have a driving license, get married and sign contracts. Many other countries have already lowered their voting age from 21 to 18, such as the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, India, Iran, Indonesia and the Philippines. And now to give us more insights on the decision by the cabinet to lower the voting age to 18, we have with us Merdeka Centre Executive Director Ibrahim Sufyan. Hi Ibrahim, thanks for joining us tonight. Now let's cut to the chase. Uh, the cabinet has decided to lower the voting age to 18. Do you think 18-year-olds um, are mature enough to make important decisions like choosing the country's leaders? Hi, thank you for having me on. It's uh, really a pleasure to join the 7th edition uh, tonight. Uh, with respect to the lowering of the voting age to 18 years old, I agree with the Cabinet's decision because uh, at 18 years old, most people are already eligible to work, they are able to serve in the military, and they are already considered an adult, they can get married and so on, and can serve uh, as uh, jury in some jurisdictions. And I think because of that, it is only about time that they be allowed to vote. Now, in one article, it was mentioned that maturity is not a requirement to participate in elections. What's your take on this and why do you say so? And also, do you think there will, this will lead to um, a changes in voting trends? At 18 years old, most people are quite aware in terms of what is going on around them, the community and the place that okay. they live. And they, in many ways, can understand how decisions made by political leaders and the government affect their daily lives. While they may not fully understand the ramifications and how the political system works, uh, they are, for the most part, aware of how it affects their surroundings, affects their work and their uh, living conditions. And so in that, in many ways, reflects maturity. While it may not encompass overarching understanding about how the whole world or the nat national political system works, but it certainly affects their daily lives and I think they can make an informed decision about that. And I think it is appropriate that they be allowed to choose leaders to represent them in the state legislature or in the parliament. Right. right. And some countries like the US, Britain, Thailand, um, the Philippines and Indonesia have already set 18 as a voting age. But most countries still maintain the age at 21. Why is that? It is true that in some countries the voting age has been lowered while others it has maintained at, 20, at 21 years old. Uh, this in many ways reflects uh, the thinking that was in the previous century, in the 20th century, where okay. many people felt that young people are not able to make good decisions, well-balanced decisions about the state of affairs and how a country or a community is run. But in this new era, especially in the 21st century, with widely available information, quick access to technology and the ability to reach out and connect with people, young people today are able to understand and gain information about how policies work, how issues affect their daily lives and can make a decision. Uh, so I think the thinking that the age has to be kept to 21 years old uh, is moot and because there are also people who are older than 21 years old who are not able to make informed decisions because of the constraints that they face in daily life. So age is not a constraint. Access to information, balanced information is the real issue here. 
Right, thank you, Ibrahim, for those insights. We'll be taking a short break. Coming up, who knew maths could be a fun subject to learn? These and more when we return. Don't go away. Thanks for staying with us. Now, let's take a look at our daily segment, Clickbait, for what's trending and making rounds in the cyber world today. Mathematics is commonly considered a teeth-gritting subject, but this tuition teacher apparently has his, way around, uh, has his way around it to not only make the learning experience fun, but also effective. Uzairi Taib, or better known as Sir Uzairi by his students at Maths Clinic, has been making rounds online with his unique teaching methods. He's back at it again with another Instagram video posted on Monday, garnering hundreds and thousands of views after being reposted on various platforms. Take a look, you'll know why. <laughs> Fun learning shouldn't be limited to maths alone, but should be applied on all subjects, since having fun is the best way to learn, after all. A bar pianist in Japan is gaining attention online for the subtle way he plays iconic music from games such as Pokemon without anyone noticing. Ryota Kikuchi, a pianist who usually performs at the Konbroyan, uh, Kon Konbryoin Kawagoe, Japan, is going viral for playing totally out of place music on his piano in a very classy setting. With over 600,000 views on Twitter, check him out playing the background music in Pokemon Red, Blue and Yellow whenever the main character jumps onto a bike. <laughs> One of the many Twitter users praised Kikuchi's cunning act, while others were requesting for new gaming music for him to play. And now updated as of 7 p.m., here are the top trending topics and searches on the internet today. On to more local news, police have apprehended seven suspects in the ongoing probe on the mass alcohol poisoning that has, that, has, that has already claimed at least 21 lives, with 17 of them from Salango. State Police Chief Dato Mazran Mansur said all the suspects were believed to be operators and workers of the shop selling the tainted alcohol. Dato Maslan told the media today that the victims who died were among 51 men who had consumed three brands of alcoholic beverages, namely Mandalay whiskey, Kingfisher beer and Grand Royal whiskey, which were purchased from multiple shops in the Klang Valley on Monday. Dua Bangladesh, uh, lima Nepal, satu India dan satu lagi unknown. He also said that as of today, there have been 12 raids in the Klang Valley area, during which authorities seized 1,030 bottles of whiskey and 1,767 beer cans. Samples have also been sent for lab tests to determine its contents. Dr. Mazlan, however, did not deny nor confirm if the shops had the same supplier, only saying that police would investigate the case from all angles. Following the incident, police have also reclassified the case under Section 304 of the Penal Code for culpable homicide not amounting to murder. Police have applied for Interpol to detain financier Lo Teg Joe or Joe Lo and his father. Inspector General of Police Tansri Mohammad Fuzi Harun said this today in response to a news portal 
report suggesting otherwise. The report published yesterday stated that the names of Lowe and his father, Tansri Larry Lowe, could not be found on Interpol's website. In a statement, the top cop also said that the application process to list an individual in Interpol's red corner notice depends on Interpol's protocol, which may take some time depending on the vetting procedures set by the international agency. Joe Lowe and his father are wanted to assist investigation into the One Malaysia Development Berhad 1MDB scandal. Malaysian authorities have sought Interpol's aid to detain the duo, who have outstanding warrants of arrest in Malaysia after they were charged with money laundering in, absen in absentia. The Election Commission EC will hold a special meeting tomorrow to set the dates for nomination and polling in the Port Dixon parliamentary by-election. Its Secretary, Dr. Muhammad Ilyas Abu Bakr, said the meeting would also set the date for the issuing of the election writ and determine the electoral rolls to be used. He also said in a statement today that the meeting would be chaired by EC Deputy Chairman Tansri Othman Mahmoud. The Port Dixon seat was vacated by its incumbent, Dr. Daniel Balagopal Abdullah, to allow PKR President-elect Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim to contest and become an MP. Dr. Daniel Balagopal won the seat in the GE14 with a majority of 17,710 votes, beating Barisan national candidate Dr. V.S. Mogan and Mahfuz Roslan of PAS. When we return, leaders of North and South Korea took a major step toward peace. Details next. Welcome back. On to the foreign front, South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un made a major step toward peace on the Korean Peninsula today as both leaders reached his agreement to permanently dismantle the North's main nuclear complex. Speaking at a joint news conference following their summit talks in Pyongyang, Moon said the North will also take additional measures, such as permanently dismantling its nuclear facility in Nyongbyon if there, if there are corresponding measures from the U.S. The leaders also said the North would dismantle a missile engine test site and launch pad in the presence of international experts. Kim had previously announced his commitment to denuclearization at his previous summits with Moon, as well as at his meeting with U.S. President Donald Trump in June in Singapore. However, he had given no concrete details on how and by when the process would be complete and negotiations between the U.S. and North Korea had since stalled. In Russia, at least five people have died when two passenger buses collided in the Veronese region near Novaya Usman on Tuesday. Local emergencies ministry reported about 20 others were injured and admitted to hospital, six of them in serious condition. The collision occurred when one bus stopped because of a technical problem and another one hit it from behind. Authorities have launched an inquiry into safety of passenger traffic following the incident. Over.
Sports. The 19th Malaysia game, Federal Territory's weightlifting athlete Jabriela Tiel Samuel stole the limelight today as she broke the national record in the women's under 75 kilogram snatch event to deliver a gold medal for her contingent. The 20 year old cracked the record in the third attempt at 80 kilograms to overcome the national record of 80 kilograms set by Johor's Arisha Farah Irwin in the 2010 Sukma in Malacca. Nor Sofia Muhammad Nordin of Kelantan took the silver and Turanganu's Amna Yasmin Young Hasbullah Young settled for bronze. Earlier, Gabriela also grabbed the gold medal in the clean and jerk after clearing 100 kilograms but failed to break the Sukma record and national record. For Sofia, once again settled, Nor Sofia once again settled for silver while Amna Yasmin again took the bronze medal. And Marvel Studios has finally released the first trailer for their female-led superhero movie, Captain Marvel, which will hit Malaysian theatres in March 2019. Take a look at the trailer as we wrap up 7 edition this evening. I'm Muhammad Ahmad Hamdan. Thanks for watching and good night. War is a universal language. I know a renegade soldier when I see one. Never occurred to me that one might come from above. Space invasion. Big car chase. Truth be told, I was ready to hang it up till I met you today. So you're not from around here. It's hard to explain. 